All right, this says you're live, which I think means that I'm live right now. Um, I, it's, this is weird, just give me a second here. Okay, so I need to now that this is live, this is a bad beginning of this video. Let's just also, how do I, yes, someone says you, okay, excellent. Let me just say this on Facebook here and Twitter here very quickly. Okay, cool. This is super um, odd right now. Okay, so um, let me just do this. I should have done this before, but I thought there was gonna be some link that was generated once this started that I would need to send, but I don't really know if that's the case. So, all right. Okay, and let's get rid of that big image that just popped up. Okay, publish, there we go. I'm back, all right. Yes, you saw, someone said I saw this yesterday. I was trying to test it, then I actually went live. Very embarrassing. I got it down, but then it apparently just stayed up. I don't know. Um, okay, cool. So I have a bunch of questions from Facebook and Twitter that I'm going to go through, and also I'm going to answer questions on the, the sidebar. Um, can you all see the sidebar? Like, is this something that uh, is, are we in a big discussion here, or can only I see the sidebar? I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, since when do you make a live stream? That is a fair question. Since right now, um, I've never done this. I just thought, you know, actually it was because I went on Facebook, uh, uh, on YouTube to, uh, to my channel for a second, which I, I'm not usually on that page because I'm not that active on YouTube and it, okay. Yes, we can see it. Good. We're all here having, hanging out. Um, and someone said, um, and someone, and, and I said like, you know, I, I went to the thing to put, put up a new video. Um, this was Winston in uh, in sandals, uh, which he got himself into. To be clear, it's, I didn't put him in sandals. Um, and I saw it said "Go live," and that it, right, it's like you can publish a post or go live right below. This is a new thing. I didn't realize you could do that on YouTube. I know Facebook can do it, but I, I've had some problems with Facebook doing it. It's like hard to find the link or something. So got a little discouraged there. But then I was like, okay, let's try it on YouTube and. I also am really off the mat right now because I'm in like long posting zone and um, thought it was like a cool chance to just try something. So if this is fun for you and not too mortifying for me, this is kind of like weird right now, uh, then we'll then we'll maybe do it again. Um, so, um, okay. So let's just, let's just start here before we, before we get into this. Um, I have, I, I tried to extract some of these questions from Twitter and Facebook, but I, I didn't, I ran out of time and then it was 11 and I was like, this isn't something you can be late for. So we, we we're here now. Um, so first uh, someone said Q and A on what, or did you mean AMA? And I realized like, I think I'm being kind of old school by saying Q and A, I meant AMA, I guess. I don't really know the difference, but this is one of those. Um, uh, yeah. Um, if I didn't, uh, if I didn't, choose one it may have been because i would want oh oh no that was my <laughs> okay that was my note to myself that i just read to you okay so what i was saying to myself there to remember to tell you is that um i i was i'm trying to answer questions that make sense here um the questions that aren't that don't make sense are either the ones that are inane there are some um and like in a name in a way that i don't even have like a funny answer to or a good answer to or Actually, there's a good amount of questions that are fascinating, but I'm like, I need, I need three hours to think about that, or I need to do some research, or I need to really, because right now, all I'm going to say is kind of the obvious view that we all have on something, unless I've thought much more deeply about it, or it's just a super long answer to do, to do it justice. So that's, that doesn't make sense right here. So trying to do answers that I've thought about a lot already, um, or that, it, that are just kind of an easy thing to answer. Um, so... Okay, so more on a little bit on wait, but why stuff before we get into the other questions, just so we can address this stuff now. All the, all the Tim's in trouble questions. Um, someone said, did you abandon that really, really big article on politics because of unforeseen developments or is it still in the works? And a lot of other people were like, when's the next post? What the hell's wrong with you? Um, I did not abandon it. I did the opposite of abandon it, which is that I've been living in it. Um, picture like a huge, massive truck of manure like the one in back to the future you know and it falls over and there's just a huge pile of shit and i'm you don't realize that someone's under there but i'm under it that's my relationship with this current post it's um it is definitely the hardest thing i've ever done in my life 
um, it's taking an insane amount of time. Even I'm not going to say that, you know, well, yeah, this takes time because this is this is a little ridiculous. We can all acknowledge it's a little ridiculous. But I will say so there's two things on the um, on the defensive side. I will say that this post is far and away the longest way why post ever. And that says something, given that I Neuralink was 38,000 words. SpaceX was 40,000 words. This the, this blew those two out of the water. And it was so long that I um, I actually kind of started over at some point. And I was like, let me, now that I'm like, work through all of this, I'm wiser about this topic than I was at the beginning. It's been months, new things stuff has happened. I've kind of consolidated my thinking through a lot of talking about it. So let's go back to the beginning and just read. So I did that, it's still by far the longest post ever. And it's also insanely complicated. It, it, it's The way you could look at it is, there's like 20 posts on my to write about list. I have a massive future posts list. There's like 20 of them that are all in this post. So they, this could have also, I could have just decided to do a big series on this topic and had a post coming out every week or two. And I'm sure a lot of you would like that more. But in this case, part of the reason that I didn't do that is that I'm making one very big point here, making one very um um, I'm trying to make, I'm trying to make a point that is super hard to make in a very divisive political tribal culture, um, coming from a white male. It's always fun. And so if I don't make this really well and thorough, um, it just won't get across. It won't get across to, except for the, the choir who already totally agrees with everything I'm going to say. Um, and that's going to be a lot of readers for those readers. I think it can help articulate what they're thinking. Um, and then many people, I think, who disagree a little all the way to a lot. I think with something this thorough, if they'll read it, I think we can really make some progress. Um, I'm not going to get into the details now because I don't want to spoil it, but it involves just, it's just one of those things. If you really, it's, look, when I started talking about SpaceX, I zoomed out and started, we, we, were, we were back in the origin of humans. When I started talking about uh Tesla, we were in um, the origin of basically what is energy. You know, we zoom way out, you go way far back. We always end up at the Big Bang, basically, in these science explainer topics. Um, for a topic like um, like this, like basic stuff that involves not, not – usually when I'm talking about social stuff, I'm making of whether to handshake or hug someone, which is a continual nightmare, by the way, still. Um, and it's fun, and it's funny. Talking about society in a really kind of – serious way um and and talking about a lot of hot button topics like i want to do a big zoom out there and the big zoom out there it doesn't land me at the big bang it lands me in basically philosophy like and psychology it lands me in what is freedom um like the concepts of um like top down uh, organization like a dictatorship or uh, or an echo chamber where everyone has to agree with the kind of commanding dogma or bottom up, um, which is like, in theory, a constitutional democracy process based where the, um, you know, the, the, the citizen body can be a huge brain um, or kind of um, an I, you know, a culture that's uh, that, 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 that is all about kind of debate and discourse and all of that. Getting into, you know, philosophy, getting into psychology, talking about stunted parts, parts of us you know, stunted parts of us socially and all this. And then I'm also just getting into the depths of kind of reasoning and how we think and history and how things have progressed in the U S and other places, and then tribalness and our tribal psychology. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of what I write about a lot often is um, the battle going in, in our brain, going on in our brain between the ancient animal side and kind of the little voice in there. that's like, shit, I'm in an animal. Okay. How do we deal with this? The little wise voice in there. And um, that's, you know, the instant gratification monkey and the rational decision maker, right? And then we have the social survival mammoth and the authentic voice. Um, there's like 20 of these uh, parts of life where this battle is happening. So this post gets, of course, deep into that too. It gets into reasoning from first principles and cooking the chef type stuff. So it, it gets into a lot of other posts, truthism posts, that post, um, very relevant for this post. Um, and this is not, nothing I just said is even like the whole second half of the post where I'm getting into the specific current events today and the culture and how it maps onto all those frameworks. So big topic, maybe too big. It's an experiment. 
Um, now that's the defensive side, and that this is you know this is a book essentially, and it books do take time. The the uh, admitting that I'm also um, a mess side is that um, the, a very close cousin, maybe even like more like a twin of my procrastination side is my perfectionism side. But it's not quite the same. Um, it's more of like a psycho than just like a piece of shit. My, my perfectionism side is just like some psychopath that I happen to live with all the time. And it has gotten a little out of hand because, you know, my first philosophy was if I'm writing about these sensitive topics, I need to listen. I need to do a lot of listening to other kinds of people's lives and viewpoints that aren't mine because I have one very specific lens. I also need to think about history and understand all the different statistics that I can pull to understand, you know, what's true and what's not and all of this. But that can get out of hand. And, you know, yes, the post will get more thorough and more accurate. And I'll come up with even more metaphors and theories. And if I, I could do that till I'm 90 and it would have even more, but no one wants that. I don't want to do one post till I'm 90. And so this to me is a little too much. I think it's not that gratifying for me to spend this long. At some point you end up with too much material and then you have to figure out how to organize it all. And my perfectionism doesn't want to cut anything. So I'm dealing with some issues over here as well, um, but should be good. I think it'll be a really good post and it's hopefully not too far from being done. Most of the writing is done. Um, so Let's move on from that. But that, that's a little update for people who um, wonder what the hell is going on. Patron, patrons now, I've been updating patrons more so, but for anyone else who's into the blog who doesn't know, that's the deal. Now there's also a podcast that I'm gonna talk about much more later. Um, I've already recorded some episodes. Very excited about this. Super fun medium. So much easier than blogging, it's unbelievable. I can, um, a, a Wait But Why reader can be, I can entertain them for one hour and it takes about a thousand times longer, maybe 200 times longer to do that than to entertain someone for an hour in a podcast. So it depends on the kind of podcast for this one is going to be very low production. So that's going to be very exciting. And that'll be something that's regular. Um, another question that came up, this is the last way, but why I think, cause I know there's a lot more interesting things to get into. But someone said, are you going to go back to the more traditional style of blogging, as in writing an article every month or so instead of every year? I like the little shot in there, although it's also kind of just saying the truth. Um, actually, the truth is there's a few different layers of blogging. Uh, one month, a month is already kind of weird. Um, I honestly miss once a week. I know a lot of other people do too. I, I, it's yet to be seen whether I can go. It's hard to calibrate that way. It's easy to get more and more thorough and try to top yourself. But the short posts are really fun, and I think they're, it's really fun to jump around topics, and it relieves the burden of having to, to get so into it. Because I'm like, this only took a week. You know this only took a week, so there's no expectations. Um, on the other hand, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll really miss uh, get, being able to dig a lot deeper, so we'll find out. But my plan is at some point, not too long from now, to kind of do something where I'm on an every week schedule again, and I'll do something where it's, you know, Alicia – uh, Wait But Why's manager of lots of things and the person who runs all of Wait But Why outside what, I'm, what I have to do. Um, she'll like have to post something every week, so I'll have to do it. So there's not, it won't be up to me. Anyway, I wanted to do something like that because I missed short posts. Okay. Now let's get to actual questions. Um, let's see. Okay. I see I should have organized this better, um, but I ran out of time and can't really be late with this, you know? Um, okay, someone said, how jazzed are you about Elon Musk these days? A lot of, this is a group of questions about Elon and a lot of the recent news. Um, I actually haven't followed it that closely. Uh, I have not tried following anything that closely right now because I'm trying to write. And I know when I start getting into Twitter and all that, I end up with a different problem, which is I start finding stuff that's relevant to my post. And then I end up reading the links and the articles and then the, finding a new thing and then say, oh, that, that really is a perfect example of this thing. I can't, I can't, it eats up a whole other week, just disappeared because I went on Twitter. So um, I haven't been following it that closely. I saw a little bit, I saw a little bit of that hit piece in the New York Times. Like, I'm not gonna say I'm like totally unbiased. I really like Elon, um, obviously I've worked a lot with him. So I've heard his side of the story in general um, in anything there could be, any story there could be. But let's just like back up here. Like to, you know, th that, that article compared him to Donald Trump. Like. That is just so crazy. Like he he, la he landed a rocket. Uh, NASA and the Soviet Union couldn't do that. 
When Tesla started, no big car company had an electric vehicle on their roster. Now they all do. Like, this is an insanely world-changing person. Uh, whose heart is truly in the right place. Like he can be a baby sometimes. Yeah, he can like, he gets, he, the thing that bothers him is not criticism of him or her companies. It's any form of inaccuracy. It's like his version of my perfectionism. He's a little bit nuts when it comes to inaccuracy. He can't handle it. He'll has to jump in and correct it. That's a pretty not bad flaw. That's like one of those flaws you'd say in a job interview when they're like, what are your weaknesses? You're like, I'm too accurate. But that is his like, that. that is, you know, one of the things he's got going on. But to me, um, I just see it as, um, you know, this is someone whose heart is actually truly where he says it is. Uh, he really cares about what he would say and the wording he would use is increasing the probability that humanity has a good future. That's literally all he thinks about. Every one of his companies, as I kind of mapped out in the Neuralink post recently, recently, every one of his companies seems like they're all very different. They all have, end with the same goal doing his best to increase the probability of a good future for humanity. So maybe that's making us multi-planetary, which is life insurance, because we're not all of our eggs are on, not on one planet anymore. Maybe it's trying to um, accelerate the advent of a sustain sustainable energy world. Maybe it's trying to build brain machine interfaces so that we can become part of AI and not maybe against it. Um, so, I mean, and then he's also really legitimately achieved a bunch of these things so far, really making serious progress. So that's all I need to, I mean, it's like, I, I'm not going to examine his character further and say like, it's like, whatever it is, it is, it, this is, this, this guy uh, is a force for good. So I think that a journalist trying to basically destroy his reputation and make him kind of, um, I don't know, just, just, just smear him. I just think I'm like, what is, what is your motive? Either you don't know that much about it or you, you want attention yourself or you're just bitter about something. That's how I see it. So I'm not just defending him to defend him. I would also have defended a lot of other um, you know, what I consider like world changers in a similar situation. Not that he should never be criticized, but to try to kind of smear his whole thing as this big joke is just to me a little silly. So that's what I think. I'm super, obviously super still into what he's doing. I think, you know, I, don't, I honestly haven't followed what's going on in Tesla that closely, not closely enough to have an interesting uh, original opinion on anything. But um, I'll just say that I, I spent a lot of time at Tesla and I, I've looked at a lot of the different things they're doing, everything from batteries to solar roofs to, um, you know, obviously cars and self-driving software. And just, they're, they're a pretty awesome technology company um, focused around energy. And like, I think they're a major force for good and they're going to do a lot of awesome things before it's all said and done. And that's about what I know now. So let's move on from that. Um, how would you fix the education system. And I'll come, I'll do, after this, I'll do one of the questions from the sidebar. So I don't know how, this is one of those questions that I almost didn't answer because I want a month to think about this or at least a couple of weeks. And I want to read a bunch about current state of the education system. But what I do know is that I went through the education system. I went through a public school system in Newton, Massachusetts, great public schools, as far as public schools go. Um, and Obviously, there were some great things like, you know, it, I, I think it was a, a pretty good exposure to a big wide range of all kinds of identities, all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds, all in the same school. So that's obviously, I think, a good, good you know, good for you. Um, and I had some great, amazing teachers, amazing teachers along the way. And like those teachers, I, I know they were amazing because here's how I would define like an amazing teacher for me would be the, the teacher that I was just like, my dream would be that, um, like I ended up in, we were all driving somewhere. And I ended up in a car with them alone for like two hours and I could just like get advice from them and ask them questions and like learn stuff from them. That's, it's that kind of person. There's a certain, this is this traffic test situation for anyone who's read a lot of the old posts. Um, it's like, it's like this, the amazing teachers are people I just like looked up to and I just wanted to hear their opinion on everything. And I just wanted to hear them talk. That was about, 10% of my teachers, maybe 20 at most. It wasn't 20, it was less than 20. And um, and then a lot of the teachers were mailing it in, you know, no, they weren't that educated themselves. They were going through the curriculum. They weren't passionate learners. Passionate learners, you learn a lot every year, right? So by the time you're whatever the age the teacher was, like, you know some shit and you can talk about it you know, you can talk about a lot of things and be interesting about it because you've also thought you're a thinker. You just play with ideas until you 
figure them out a little bit. You come up with original takes on stuff and you learn. I'm freezing. Let's just, let's just, I brought this here. I didn't want to get up in the middle, but I just thought this might happen. Okay. Much better. Freezing, freezing apartment. Doesn't the weather look nice in New York City? I'm gray. Okay. Um, and so the, the bigger point here is that this is the Seth Godin line. What is school for? School to me should be doing like a few things. It should be, I think, lighting up a child's mind, lighting it up with whatever naturally is going to light that up or teaching a student, teaching a child about something that, you know, then lights up their, their mind. So th when I say I wanted to be with that teacher in the car, that's because my, that, that person lit my mind up. And um, so that's one thing it should be doing, lighting the child's mind, because that's when they're going to suddenly, their mind's going to grow really quickly. You know, they're going to, it's going to just, gonna, it's going to be in the flow. The kid's mind's going to be in the flow with learning something or with getting advice. You know, a good teacher is just wisdom. It's just pouring on the students all year from that teacher. Um, and I remember, I remember the very specific, you know, little things that certain teachers said um, that just wisdom, you know, these are certain, th those certain teachers. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it should be teaching. It should be a place where the student can learn about themselves, can learn about the world, can learn about what, where they might want to take their energies. Um, now, obviously, a second grader maybe is, you know, a, you know, we have other stuff to do. We have to make sure you can read, um, you know, cor uh, you know, but I think that um, it should be doing a lot more of that than it does. And certainly it did for me. Um, it should um, obviously, you know, the, the obvious answer that I should have put first is that you need the core stuff. You, you need to be, have, be able to write a good email and, you know, appear and you need your grammar in shape just because that's the society we live in. That's part of pre preparing a student for the world is making sure that they can kind of pass the kind of cultural tests. So they need to be able to write well and speak well, and they need to be able to um, have basic understanding of science. Um, that's just basically getting what's going on. Um, they need to have a basic understanding of history. It's people, it's, 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 it's amazing to me that some of the, I always think some of the least wise people, the people who are just, I don't know, I just find that they're, you know, the least grown up, they almost, they regularly don't seem to know much about history. They, they're, they're not educated on it. When you're educated on history, you, you become wise because it's, you have the, it's like you're, um, it's like learning history is in a small sense, like living through all of the past a little bit. And think about it, if you lived through all the past, how much wiser would you be than someone who's just born and doesn't know anything yet? So the people who are, don't know history, they're just doing a bunch of things that are obvious mistakes to someone who does know history. And when you look at the world and you look at leadership and when you look at other stuff, you can, people who know history can just see they have this clarity to see the mistakes that are being made. The other people have the fog of not knowing history. So you need that in school. And, and so there's, so, so there's those things. Then I would say, um, it should also like, I feel like school plus homework should be one unit. I don't think students should have to leave school and do much stuff. I think the school plus homework should be one unit that maybe goes till 4 PM or maybe even five, but then the kids free. Talked to my cousin the other day who was talking about his daughter is an eighth grader and she works till 1130 or midnight every night, has no life. Something's very, very wrong, right? Very wrong. By the way, she's also not going to remember any of this stuff because she's just memorizing a bunch of stuff for the test. So the stuff you learn should also be, if, if the kid's mind is lit up, they're going to remember. I promise you. So those are a lot of like general thoughts. Obviously, I haven't like structured my thoughts that well yet. I'd like to write a post on this at some point. Um and I think that we need, we need a lot of reasoning from first principles right now because school is just incredible reasoning from analogy situation where a lot of what we're doing, the curriculum and the structure is literally from the industrial era, you know, multiple hundred years ago. Um, and it hasn't been updated. I don't think I was educated that differently than my parents were. Um, that's a problem. We should, be we should be preparing kids for 2030, not, you know, 1820 or whatever. So now that cost of that kind of, mini school and scale it. I don't know. Um, okay. Let's, let's do one from Paris podcast happening. Yes. At some point soon. I think uh, it's really relevant, this current post to it. So he and I are maybe waiting for that to happen. We, we talked a little about just putting it on hold, but yes. Um, love Sam Harris. Love his podcast. We'd love to talk to him about all this stuff on the podcast. So that is a plan. Let's see what else is going on here in the comments. Um, let's see. Let's see. 
any boring post on the boring company. Um, yeah, at some point I'd like to do a hyperloop like that. I wrote a little post on the hyperloop. I actually succeeded. I did a little post. Um, and it took me like a day. So I'd like to do that on the boring company. I really, um, for a while now, I'm not going to be able to like get into a, a long post on something like that. But, um, uh, cryonics. Okay. Let's talk about this for a second. So oh, I still believe post. I think, um, the cryonics people continue to impress me by being kind of humble and, you know, educated on their stuff. And, um, and I am currently cryoprocrastinating. Um, well, actually that's not true because I finally, so I first have to get, it, this is the problem. There's a lot of barriers to entry. I took me a long time to get the life insurance, life insurance, kind of, um, an icky thing to have to get really icky. I didn't know about how to get life insurance and what kind to get and the universal and the term and it's still icky. I don't know what to do. So I did that. Though. Then I had to sign up at Alcor, did that. That was another couple months of cryo procrastinating. And I have one thing left, which is I have to do something, but there's the, there's the word. There's one of, there's a few words that every procrastinator has nightmares about. And it's like, it like hovers above them. And it's like, they wake up in a cold sweat. And one of them is notarized. I'm, I was told I have to fill something out and get it to witnesses and then get it notarized. I'm very upset about this. Um, I don't want to even figure out how to get something notarized. I don't like any part of that. So I'm going to do it. And that's the last step. And then I'm good to die. But I haven't done it yet. But I'm very excited about it. And I've also had a really interesting discussion um, yesterday with the founders of Nectomy. Nectome, Nectome, um, super interesting guys who are doing different way to preserve, you know, for brain preservation. Um, I won't get into more details now because I don't know if I'm even allowed to, but I'm definitely going to write a post on that, which would be kind of Cryonics part two at some point because that's super, super interesting and they're, they were very interesting. Um, they lit up my mind like a good teacher. Um, VR, okay, I've gotten some questions about VR. Yes, I did a lot of like VR talk and VR promises uh, and then nothing yet. Um, Definitely still a plan. I have so much to say about VR and the future of it. There's a couple reasons that are, it's not happening at this exact moment. One, this massive post. Um, two, I feel like there's certain waves that new tech goes into. Not new tech, but, you know, tech wave. And it kind of is a hype cycle. And everyone's reading about it. Everyone wants to talk about it. And then, you know, inevitably, the hype then accelerates way past where the technology and the industry is. And then everyone gets disappointed because that can't live up to that hype. And then there's a big kind of like uh, period where everyone's ignoring it. Um, I think that um, VR is in that stage right now. And it's not that you can't, you know, it's always a great time to write about something as exciting as the future of AR and VR, by the way. Just to be clear, when I'm writing about VR, when I'm talking about VR, what I really mean is there's a spectrum that goes from 0% virtual reality to 100%. So right now, um, I don't know, the internet, the screen accounts, no, not really. So right now, um, you're in 0%. We're almost always in 0%. If I had like some kind of glasses or something where everything looked exactly the same except buildings had a little name with the name of the building on it, that's like 5%, 3%, okay? So it's almost all physical world except I'm seeing little, little hint of the virtual world and labels. And then you can go all the way up to where I see, I'm walking down the street and I see real, the cars that are coming by, I see them and I see people, but the people all look like pandas, cartoon pandas. And the cars look like big cartoon, you know, rhinos or something. That sounds fun, by the way. I would definitely do that. Um, that's like maybe 80% where you're still seeing real objects, but like nothing is real. And then you get to 100%, which is what we consider virtual reality. You have a total headset on and you're not seeing anything that is in the real world. So this spectrum itself is a very exciting thing. I think there's going to be massive industries that form on all different parts of the spectrum. So there's, there's really many industries that are going to come from this for totally different reasons. Um, and there's a lot I have to say about it. Um, but I do feel like it's one of these, it's just not the thing that everyone is, everyone wants to talk about crypto right now and other certain things. And um, I don't, I'm still not sure when the right time to write a post is. Is it right in the middle of all the hype? Is it, Right? Is it just getting started to kind of help get it going? Um, or is it in kind of a dead period when you wake people back up to this idea? I don't really know, but I think I'm probably going to try to 
there's going to be, I'm, I can tell you that my prediction is that VR slash AR is going to absolutely be an unbelievable, it, it basically as big a deal as the internet. I think that in like 10 years, a billion people have access to VR daily um, for many different reasons. But, um, and so I think um, there's going to be some moment in the next maybe year, maybe year and a half when like, I don't know, some new system comes out, some new VR game that everyone's talking about. And suddenly all the hype explodes again. And that's when I think I'm probably going to dive in. Um, okay, let's go back to Twitter for a second here. Um, well, thoughts on blockchain, Bitcoin. Definitely the thing I've gotten the most emails about um, in the last year. Uh, so I, here's the issue. When I do a post... My ideal situation is that there's a bunch of smart, curious people who are at, just say there's a one through 10 knowledge scale where one is you've never heard of the thing before. And 10 is um, you, actually, I, I like something better. There's a two by two. So there's knowledge, one through 10. 10 is you're the world leading expert. One, you are, um, you know, never heard of it. And now there's a X axis, which is curiosity. Okay, so I'm never writing for the people on the low curious side. They're not reading me. I promise you that they're not reading anything I write. Um, so I'm looking for the people who are on the right, but they're kind of low, that quadrant, okay? That's my readers, and that, that's who I'm targeting, because that's me about most things. Most of us are low knowledge about most stuff. We just haven't had the time. We know we're maybe a two or three. So, you, you know, three means you've read some articles, you know the basic deal, you can have a chat about it, but you don't really get it fully and you don't know much more than that. Um, and so my job, because I'm down there with my readers, and then uh, my job is to get up to a uh, six through a bunch of research and interviews and questions and all of that. And then maybe that takes me a week, maybe it takes me a month or longer, but either way, I then say, you know, and I do this, and this is another another question that I'll get into in a second about my process, but um, I, I then um, say, I, so this just took me X amount of time, and I did a bunch of stuff that wasn't didn't turn out to be necessary to get up here, but I couldn't see it in my fog. I didn't know what was important and what wasn't in the fog that I was in. Now I'm much clearer, I can look back and I can see the topic much more clearly, and I can, t can figure out what's really interesting. The things that blew my mind as I learned about this, I note those. The things that were really hard to get and grasp and the hardest things, the big roadblock, but I finally got it and it was critical to getting there. I note those. Now I look back and I say, how can I bring someone else who's just as smart and curious as I am, but they're not, they haven't done this chunk of research that I just did. How can I take them by the hand and bring them to where I am a lot quicker and a lot more fun than how I just did it? So that's about where, now I don't want to be the seven or an eight because that's just going to take way, way, way too long. And I also get bored. I think it starts to get very technical up there in a way that's less interesting. I kind of feel like the really good stuff is at the six. Now, if I actually got a PhD in something, I'm sure I would have whole new worlds of interest in it, but that opportunity cost is too high. So that's the game I'm playing. Get, to, get from a two or three to a six, bring other people there. Next, next topic. And the good topics are the one where I think there's a lot of people bunched in that quadrant. A lot of really curious people who wish they knew more about it. Bitcoin blockchain certainly was one of those. Now, here's the issue is that I feel like I'm not even at, a, well, I'm in a two. I'm not at a three. I'm in a legit two because I haven't dug in yet. And it's, and I, I might even be at a one and a half um, for all the things that could be to know and understand about this and the future of it. No, that's not true. I'm at a 2.2. I've like, you know, I've, I've, I've done a little. I've done a little where I could like, I get, I, I get the basic idea. I think I used to be at lower, but um, the issue is that this is such an important topic right now that a lot of people who I would like to be writing for have done a lot of work and gotten up to maybe a three, three and a half or a four. And I feel like this is an especially hard one to get to a six. So it's not that I don't want to do it. I really, really do. But I need to work so hard, not just to, right now, I feel like I know less than my smart friends about this. I need to get to where they are and then pass them and get way up to the place where I could blow their mind about a bunch of stuff. That's not quick. That's not going to be quick. That's going to, and, and especially this is one of those topics, a little like AI, where there's not like great literature on it because no, no one knows what the hell they're talking about. 
So you have to really read so much that you start to see this big picture of what the species knows, where no one article is going to give that to you. There's not much consensus. So the answer is that if I take it on, I have this is going to be one of those that takes a few months, long posts for sure. Definitely worth doing. It's just a question of opportunity cost. So I and, and I'm also a little regretful I didn't do it like a year ago. It's annoying because it's like it would have been such good timing. And now it's like a little, you know, so that's kind of my thought there. Um, OK, let's just go back here. Uh, uh, someone said, do you consider yourself to be a polymath? Um, I, I don't really know what that word means. I think people use it to be to mean like, you know, Da Vinci. And like, because he's like, I don't know, he probably was like a nine across the board. So that, of course not. What I am is like a curious person whose job it is to learn. And I happen to be someone who likes to jump around topics. I think anyone who's curious and even just their bedtime reading is something that they're going to learn. Like, I think that they can get to a level where they, they, they you, what happens is like a lot of the areas of knowledge, you know, history and science, for example, or uh, philosophy and psychology or whatever, they seem like they're different until you start to get to a certain level and you realize they all kind of merge in a lot of ways into a kind of a general understanding of what the hell's going on here in this existence that we have woken up into. And, uh, and so I think that it starts to get addictive to switch topics when you get up, because you want to like round out all the ideas. You start to see all this overlap. And I think that's kind of like, again, I'm six, not an expert in anything, but Six lands a fun place to be to get up where you know you 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 start to see all this crossover and you and I realize that in the same post the same themes keep coming up in different totally different posts not planned by me but I'm like oh my god this is another version of that so um, yeah I consider myself like someone who is playing in six land who's trying to be like the best ever at being in six land um, and I'm working on that so yeah that's that's kind of my thing um, let's see. Um, This was one, I just want to note this as this is a classic thing a reader would ask or a friend would say that I don't understand. It could also be discussed. Oh, someone asked me about democracy, which I think is a whole topic that I'm not going to get into because I'm going to get into it in depth in my post. I have a lot to say about democracy and, you know, what's awesome about it and what is you know, the shortcomings are, especially in the world that we're moving into. It may have much bigger shortcomings than it has had. And I think that's something we need to worry about and talk about. But then they said, it could also be discussed in combination with the topic of, oh, um, yeah, about democracy. It could also be discussed in, in combination with the topic of blockchain technology as the, as the latter is needed for a liquid democracy system to be hack proof. Uh, you know, fuck that shit. I, I, there's so many words in there, I don't know. I, it's like, it's, this is how I feel at the beginning of a lot of posts where I'm just like, why are the adults saying these scary adult words that I don't get? And then I would basically work for a bunch of weeks until I was like, oh, well, the liquid blockchain is exactly what you need because, but it's, man, it does not, it doesn't feel good being in two land. I don't like it. It reminds me of being like in high school and reading about current events or reading about like, you know, I don't know, political theory or something. And I would like, um, I would just be like, ah, the, the icky adults are saying the icky words or like finance. And they were saying, you know, oh, during the recession, during the uh, 2008, and they're talking about the credit default swaps, icky land. I was like in icky land and I'm just like, I can read an article. I can memorize how to talk about it. Well, of course, it was the credit default swaps because they were making bets on more bets and they were uh, taking, you know, they, they, they were making assumptions about how the, the housing market was still going to go. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about though. This is the big thing in my current post. There's a huge difference between reciting a bunch of lines that you've been told and maybe having a foggy, thinking you have a foggy understanding. And by the way, this is that Dunning, Dunning Kruger thing where, this way, where you know you learn a little and you're like, yeah, I, I have. And someone's talking and you, you're so excited to jump in with that pre, that line that you memorized, that that opinion that you're so excited to now have because you read that op-ed that had that opinion. And it sounded smart. That is not knowledge at all. It's not knowledge. It is not knowledge. It's the beginning. It's it's but it's 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 the very very beginnings of knowledge. But it's not knowledge. Knowledge is you have to work very hard for it. It's not easy, but it's so delicious having it. And you have to work really hard. And it's when you can deeply knowledge is when you could do a Q and A. You know, I know I'm I know about a topic when I do a talk on it, and then there's a Q and A after, and there's twenty questions. And I'm like, wow, I really knew the answer. I had a good answer. 
a thoughtful, original answer for all 20. Now I have some knowledge on this topic. Again, I'm not a nine, but I'm, that's a six, right? There's a, so many people out of one and a half or two just spouting their mouths very confidently with so much conviction, and they don't know, they don't understand. They could not handle a debate against a person who was really high knowledge on a stage. They would never engage in that, which is why they get so mad when people dissent from them. I'm not going to get further into this now, but the point is, this is a classic example of that sentence I read. I'm sure some people here are like, you're kind of dumb. You get it because they have a tree trunk. If you have a tree trunk in this stuff, it all makes sense. I don't have it. I need to work on it, building it. Once I have the tree trunk, that line fits right onto it somewhere. So there's my little thing about that. Um, <laughs> okay, so a few people uh, asked about my process. I'm going to be quick about it because I think I've talked about it a decent amount and I think there's more interesting things. But for people who want to research or want to be, you know, into writing. Basically, uh, to get to the three, from a three to a six, the internet is unbelievable. It's unbelievable if you want to learn something. Just Google, like, if I wanted to learn blockchain, you know, really understand it, really under, really get not just what it is, but how, you know, but understand how it can be applied in all these different areas and all the different things that might be able to change and the philosophy behind it and the pitfalls and whatever. I would just Google like blockchain and open up a new new window. And then I'd Google, you know, blockchain future. And then I'd open up a new window. And then I'd read about something and I'd realize it involves, you know, the, the core of it is this cryptography or not, not cryptography, whatever it is. The, um, you know, the whole encryption. That's what I meant. And I would, I would Google encryption. And then I'd Google history of encryption. Then I'd Google blockchain encryption. And then I'd Google Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, Maybe Bitcoin versus Ethereum. And then I would go, it did, no rhyme or reason, just stuff. And then for each one of those windows, I go back and I basically hold down the command key and I just do click, 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 click and open up 10 new tabs in each of these windows. So now I have like 70 windows open and I just start reading. You know, Wikipedia is a good place to start. It um, just rounds out the, even just gets you to start to realize what tabs you should be opening. Um, it's, you know, nothing, and, and I'm going to read a bunch of tabs. Some of them are going to be mu pretty credible journal articles. Some of them are going to be Gizmodo sum ups. Not one of those I'm going to assume is trustworthy on, but when I've, when I've read any of them, I start to have a really rounded out understanding both of the topic and also where I'm still, I still don't get certain things. Then I dig deeper into that. So I do a lot of that. This also can be, sometimes I'm not in the mood to read. YouTube has so many good explainers. You know, those teachers that I want to light the kids of today up. They're on YouTube. There's the, the YouTube explainer videos that have a ton of, have millions of, of subscribers. You know, um, I said, you know, Smarter Every Day, Minute Physics, Kurz Gassat, um, uh, CGP Gray. I mean, I love all of these, right? Uh, these are, um, oh, three brown, one blue. I just found the other day. Unbelievably great. Um, these are those best teachers. And they have all these, they're just these teachers teaching millions of people online with animation, with humor, um, and they're great explainers. So I'll go on YouTube and let some of them explain some stuff to me. Um, and I'll, I'll sometimes I'll have someone explaining one little piece of it, another little piece of it. No one needs to explain the whole picture because that's my job is to start to understand the whole picture. So I do that. Then comes like the hardest and least fun part for me is because that part's fun. You know, I'm learning and it, and it starts, it's, you know, learning is like learning the guitar. You know, it's not fun. It's maddening and you're, fingertips hurt and then you start to get your calluses and you start to get your muscle memory and you're like oh my god this is the most fun ever and then you get addicted that's how learning is you have to get past that first phase when you, it, it's it's icky it's not interesting it's it's hard to understand and then it starts to click and then it becomes fascinating and then you can't stop reading about it so that's really good then i get to the hard part which is outlining because this is what i'm saying now i have to take all of that mess and i'd say you know what how what how can i basically create um a pathway that I can take someone by the hand and it's a fun pathway to go on. How can I like structure this into like a fun little obstacle course for someone? Um, and that makes sense. That's logical. It's memorable. What are the, you know, the terms that you're going to make this memorable? How can I rephrase this to make it clear? That's just really, really hard. Then the writing happens. Um, and that usually, if the outline is good, that goes quickly. And that's also miserable. Um, I can't stand like starting writing at any given point, especially when I hit like a snag or I start to get perfectionist about like, oh man, this paragraph is kind of redundant now, but I like the way I worded this thing so much. And I like the joke in that one. So I can't lose either of them, but then they're both redundant and I'll just sit there dealing with that for an hour and a half.
half wanting to kill myself. Um, but then I can get into a flow. Writing flow is super fun. Then comes the drawing, which I also hate um, because my hand is doing a lot of this. My hand gets tired. I'm also an awful artist, so that is just a big impediment. Um, but again, there's certain moments that it's kind of flowy a little bit, but kind of not because drawing is hard. And then I especially hate having to draw like the um, the backgrounds. Like once I've drawn, like I, I, I do this really old post called like the God cart is the God cartoon about God and his son, Jesus, and they were having little issues. And that kitchen took me like 20 years. I've never, I can't tell you how long that, so anytime there's like a sky and there's some, oh, sometimes I'm like, oh, okay. So this is a little someone sitting on like a park bench. And then I realize I'm like, oh, but let's like show that there's street here and there's a sidewalk. Suddenly I'm fucked because once I do that, once it's not just like a line that they're sitting on basically, now there's depth. I don't know how to do this. I'm like, okay, well, how do you make the curb come up from the sidewalk? And then there's like a sky. Now is that there? But I do the sky and it looks like it's like, it just looks wrong. And then I have to go look at cartoons online and it's a nightmare. The, um, in both the, in the, uh, there's a little mini post called Oceans in Clay. And I, I'm embarrassed about how long those drawings took me. Uh, like just trying to draw a shoreline with like shoreline looking water was like one of the great challenges of all of humanity. It's like Elon landed a rocket, but I I drew that shoreline and it was so hard. So then in my last post on careers, I had to draw another uh, shore and I was like, damn well bet I'm just gonna copy that. So I did, so that's the same shoreline. Um, anyway, then I then the, then then, then I, 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 I get to I go back into the couch because writing is like, you know, Drawing and so then I then I go back and I get to go back and read the whole thing and revise it. That is more fun, but still icky. Then I post it and everything is great. It's super fun because now I get to actually. It's like I also I'm just doing all of this one sided thing. And then finally, finally I get to like, uh, it gets to connect to the other side. That's the whole point. It's like uh, electricity has nowhere to go, and finally it connects with all these people. Super gratifying, and you know it's always going to be both positive and negative feedback. And obviously, you know, negative feedback is, it doesn't feel good, but it's also like, I, you know, unless it's like you were inaccurate about something, which then I go change immediately. And then people are like, no, he wasn't in the comments. And it's funny because I just changed it because I'm a blogger and you don't have to be professional. Um, but, um, but negative feedback, just like, you know, I thought, you know, I think you're wrong about this. That's just interesting to me. I'm just like, I'm actually just like, I literally just want to hear what you all think about this thing that I'm so, and I just, it's also, I have the luxury of having that be pleasant because Wait Why readers tend to be very thoughtful and educated and smart and interested in all of that. So um, we have a nice comment section area. I, I imagine if I were on a different site, you know, it would just be like people totally misunderstanding it, people reading the first sentence and writing an angry comment and not reading it. And of course there's some of that. And with this next post, there's going to be more of that than ever, um, but that's okay. And usually that's not how it goes. So that's a little about the process. Um, let's go back to the live chain here. Um, let's see, let's see. Someone said, what about Kurzgesagt? And I mentioned them, but you didn't hear me, but maybe it was before I said that. Yeah, let's just quickly, you know, mention them again. And it's not easy to spell, K-U-R-Z-G-E-S-A-G-T. Uh, yes, German word. Um, and, uh, and I know the founder of Kurzgesagt, Philip, who's truly one of the greatest, nicest, most interesting, like humble, best dudes I've ever met. But that's not why I'm plugging this site because I'm friends with him. I actually was plugging this site before I ever met him because I came across it and I was like, oh, well, this is unbelievably good and addictive. So everyone should check it out. The videos are just, I know that it's it's basically, you know, wait, but why quality on the video world. Like it's these, they spend like a thousand cumulative hours on a five minute video. So they're very awesome. Yep, three blue, one brown. I said it wrong. Um, I'd listened to his pod, his, uh, I watched his YouTube videos on, um, first math calculus, never found calculus interesting until he explained it. And I was like, this is so intuitive and so, so interesting. And all this all came back to me, which is kind of fun. Um, and also I watched his stuff on machine learning on um, best explanation of machine learning I've ever come across. So really, I'm really into good YouTube channels. It's one of the most, like the best things about the internet. Um, and yes, let's, okay, there's more questions about the podcast. Let me just mention a couple more things. I'm going to do an official announcement, but people who are here, I guess, will get a sneak preview of the idea. Um, 
Uh, it's going to be lightweight, but why? Different, you know, one-off episodes that are totally on a different topic. And it's some combo of an, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversation interview with this person and a topic. It's like, you could, I could, you could either say I pick a topic and then this person is the perfect person to talk about it with and dig, dig into it and let me grill them. Or you can say you pick a person and then you use that as what's the great topic here. But either way, it's not like interviews. It's like me obsessively grilling someone who lights my mind up basically. So um, the episodes are not short, as you can imagine. We're going to try to do every two weeks and that's going to be not, you know, this is, you know, how there's like Elon time with, then there's Tim time, which is even far crazier. Um, I literally don't, yeah, I'm not a rational agent, as Andrew Waypoy, co-founder, has once said. Because he said, you know, when are we going to, we were trying to make a plan. And I said, well, here's the plan. He said, I, you're not a rational agent when it comes to this. And I, he was right. He's very correct. So, so um, it's going to go up every two weeks automatically because Alicia's in charge of the schedule. She's scheduling the interviews you know, after we plan who we're going to do. She schedules, puts them on the schedule, and then, She's doing a lot of the editing. We're a little two-person team working very hard over here, but I don't think um, more production is necessarily what we need here. We just need to have great conversations and get them out. I don't think people here care about production as much as getting really, you know, regular schedule and getting things out. So um, every two weeks, at least two-hour episodes. I didn't know I was going to do that, but I should have known. I already have, uh, you know, I, I talked to a paleontologist who is one of these science polymaths. By the way, there's two kinds of scientists. There's, I've learned this from talking to a lot of scientists. There's a scientist who was good at school and now they're doing science and they're actually kind of boring and they don't really, they have all these, um, they have this skill, they have, they're basically a technician, but they're not interested in knowing everything. And that makes them not that interesting to talk to at all. They don't, they don't have like bigger, broader thoughts about this stuff. And then there's the science polymath, the scientist polymath who's just, not only are they curious, but their career has been learning. And they know everything. So this is one, Ken Lacovara. Huge fan of his. Love the guy. Love his TED Talk. Love his book. He writes about dinosaurs. He discovered the world's largest known dinosaur. Um, and I talked to him for almost three hours. I really wore him out. but Because um, we, we went back into the whole history of life. It was great. So anyway, it should be a lot of fun. I don't want to spoil more things now. Um, Someone else while we're here asked me for podcast recommendations and uh, book recommendations. I always get this question and I, I, I never want to answer it because I want to like, it's so unsatisfying. I know, I'm, I know I'm forgetting amazing things that I just have. I need to like one time, like write down everything I've ever read and listened to and then really go through and like pick out why I, you know, so I don't like to quite just give it the answer, but a couple of recent things are um, podcasting, uh, Dan Carlin. I mean, it's like, if you like, wait, but why? It's because you like really thorough deep dives um, from like a curious person, right? This is, could not be more that. This is someone who is so incredibly passionate about history, but also such a good teacher, which don't always go together. He's so good at explaining stuff. And it's just the deepest dive you'll ever get into these topics without taking a course on it. And it is a course. So I listened to his World War One series called... Um, uh, Blueprint for Armageddon, a uh, six parts. I, I could not recommend it more. I understand the whole world better. I understand everything better. And, and of course, I understand World War One like I never thought I could. So um, that's a big recommendation for me there. Um, and then uh, on the book side, I just read a little book called, well, it's called A Little History of the World. And it's interesting how not famous this book is because it should be. It's, um, it's written a long time ago, but it's just beautifully written, goes through all of history, which is my kind of book. And um, obviously it's surface. It can't get into everything that much depth, but it's told like a grandfather sitting around telling the story of history to a bunch of kids. And that's, I like when people talk to me like I'm five. So I was super into that book. So let's just, we'll leave it there um, for now because uh, this will be long. Um, so um what was the channel with machine learning explainer? Brown, one blue, or three. Let's just look this up. Three blue, one brown. Numbers written as numbers. Um, great machine learning, three-part series. And, and by the way, you know why I like YouTube? Let me tell you something. I'm a very slow-ass learner. I do, not, I do not pick things up quickly. 
And when someone's explaining things quickly and I, I actually don't, it doesn't sink in. But I'm a, when, I, when I do get it, I really get it. I'm one of those learners. I also read super slowly. I'm like the slowest reader, fiction or nonfiction. But I can tell you basically the entire plot and like specific lines in a book I read 18 years ago. Because when I do absorb it, it's super in there, but it takes me a while. So YouTube, perfect, because you know what I can do? I can press K, which is a good tip, by the way, if you don't know. That's pause on YouTube. And J is back 10 seconds and L is forward 10 seconds. I'm constantly using those. But this is something, pause the screen for a little bit, press J, go back, watch it again, pause, think about that for a while, go back one more time. Then I can move forward and that's how I absorb it. So that's why I love a good YouTube explainer. Um, what do you think is needed to solve climate change? Um, all I'm going to say about this, because obviously that's a large can of worms, is that one of the things we need for sure is the ability to talk about this topic in a civil adult way. It is one of, if once things have been, become politicized, um, that's it. You can't talk about it. And talking is how it's like, we are each a neuron in a big brain here. If we can't talk, the neurons can't, there's no, the dendrites and axons become silent. Okay, the brain needs to think, we need to argue. We need to put out, you know, when you're brainstorming for a, a, a name of a company, which Andrew and I have done many times, we've had some very bad names, by the way, too. Um, what we do is we have a big whiteboard and we, we have this really clear rule that there's no, like, mocking anyone's ideas. There's no bad idea because the idea is, and that's not just me being super millennially, it's, it's actually for a purpose, which is that sometimes a bad idea helps you see a good idea. Sometimes someone says something kind of crazy, but then someone says, well, wait a second, what if we actually did combined it with this? And suddenly you've hit the good idea. That's how you get outside the box a little bit. Otherwise, if you're, if everyone's scared to say something outside the thing that could be, you know, construed with some way, everyone's just going to safely say what we already think. Everyone's just going to preach to a very specific choir it's so boring and so unproductive. Climate change is in, impossibly complicated. Okay, so I, I, you know, we need to be able to, and this is not a criticism of one side of the political spectrum because uh, obviously, you know, the the, the right has their, uh, their 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 areas where they should be very seriously criticized here. But the left does too. The left is terrifying to talk about climate change with, because if you say anything a little bit wrong, they stamp you. They stamp you with the stamp. You're a denier forever because you, you you had the nerve to argue that maybe this particular tactic isn't good. So that we need to be able to talk about it. And it's like right now the brain can't think about this problem well um, because it's mired in politics. So we'll get into that more some other time. I'm going to get into trouble here just on my Q&A. Um, uh, someone said you can change a single fact of history from ancient Egypt to modern days. What would you change? I want to make a dinner table just on that. And the dinner table should probably come back, just not regularly. It was kind of like a lot. But um, I do miss it for questions like this, which I just want to read everyone else's answers. If you could change a single fact of history for me. Here's the main problem with this question. It's the back to the future issue. I change one fact in history. I don't exist. So like I can be selfless and be like, well, but like, oh, you can save all these people just for your life. But what does that mean? It's like the, the, I, I like woke up in a book, right? And or like my life is like a book, and I'm reading this. It's like if I if I don't exist, it's like taking that whole book and it does the book doesn't exist for me. So what? It's like a change of make the book better, but now you know the book doesn't exist for me. So yeah, it's a tremendously selfish thing. Elon wouldn't agree with that because he's very species focused, not self focused. But I don't know. I, I, it's, it's the first question would be: Would you change something? Would you change something? given that it probably means that you don't exist. And by the way, everyone else on this current planet doesn't exist. It's kind of like mass genocide. You're kind of genociding everyone so that there's a whole new group of people here and some other suffering didn't happen. Plus, okay, let's also keep in mind that whole Zen proverb thing. You know, I'm going to get this wrong, but like the guy, you know, gets a horse and he's like, yay, I have a horse. And then the Zen master is like, we'll see. And then he falls off the horse and he's like, shit, I broke my leg. This is so bad. And the Zen master's like, we'll see. And then they're, they're like, next day they come and they're like, we need people for the army. You have a broken leg. Yes, you can't go and get killed in the army. And the guy's like, this is the best thing. And the Zen master's like, you dick. You're not clear on this lesson yet. We'll see. 
And so that's a very, very, very relevant proverb. This should always, always be thought about in history, big picture history, and also in your life. It's unbelievable. You know, you go through the worst breakup. It's such a will see situation, right? I mean, you know that. Um, World War One and World War Two. Speaking of Dan Carlin, is that World War One was like this thing, this geopolitical thing. World War Two was a combo of like it was it was, it was part two of the same one war. I think maybe in far history they'll view this as like the Great War that involves both sides. But um, the second thing is that one guy kind of did this thing. Like it wasn't you know World War One was brewing. It might have happened, you know, for many reasons. World War II wasn't really brewing. This dictator got control. And, you know, I don't think, I think if Hitler wasn't around, I really think the entire thing doesn't happen. So just say you do that. Okay, wow. How many people died in World War II? 75 million? Like, clearly a great thing to do. You might do that. And then something much, much, much worse happens. You don't know. We don't know. Um, maybe the species is extinct in 2150 in a non-Hitler world, and it's not extinct in a Hitler world. We don't know. So I would say that my real answer is that I don't want to change something because I don't, don't want to not exist. And everyone else is going to not exist. It's kind of shitty. And my other answer is the Zen thing. So there we go. I wouldn't change anything. There you have it. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, you know what? Most people don't want to hear about Winston, but someone asked about it. In fact, two people asked about it, and I want to talk about Winston. Oh, no. Oh, no, he's at summer camp. I was going to go get him for you. Winston's at summer camp. He's at my friend Jake's house for the summer for the fourth year in a row where he can tramp around the, the kind of the backyard area. So no Winston for you. But the answer, someone said, what kind of tortoise is Winston? I've, I bought Winston. I acquired the rights to Winston in November of um, 05. He was born eight months earlier, so he's 13. He's a teenager in his awkward phase, and he's humping things. This is a new little um, party trick of his. Um, he's a leopard tortoise, which means he's supposed to live in the African desert eating grass, and instead he lives in a New York apartment eating romaine lettuce. Um, and then someone says, Winston already arrived at the beach because I did this video where he had a sandal, but that reminded me that I used to, when I lived in L.A., I used to take Winston to the beach. And it was super fun because my favorite thing was I just let him go. And it's amazing how far that dude will walk. I mean, if you just let him out, he'll, he'll walk like a cumulative mile in a day. So he just starts moseying like he does. And I watch him. Of course, I have to keep my eye on him or I will lose. He'll disappear. So I'm watching him. But then I watch the fun, the most fun thing is people walk by and they assume it's a wild thing. And they freak out. And everyone's gathered around. They're taking pictures. And then someone's like, oh, let's put him back in the ocean. And I have to like run over and save him because he's a land tortoise. And he would uh, – that would not – that would be the end of Winston very quickly. So – all right, there's your Winston ketchup. Um, let's see. Will you go to Mars once they've colonized it and overcome all the deathy stuff? Why, why not? Um, come on. Of course I'm going to go to Mars. Uh, it, honestly, even before they overcome it, as long as the, the ride over isn't deathy and the landing isn't deathy or the ride back, I don't mind if I have to live underground in a bunker for a couple years. Um, now... Here's what I really secretly want, is I want somehow SpaceX to decide they want a writer to go, like, loop around Mars before they were able to land people. Because I don't really have kids yet. It's kind of a good time to go to Mars. And that maybe that would happen. I'm not holding my breath, but I feel like that's a half a percent chance. Half. Elon's just that weird. Um, yeah. Half a percent. And uh, and so, but now more realistically, say it's 2032, okay, 2034, 2036. And it's like, you know, it's now a thing that you can do. You can go to Mars on a 26-month or a 52-month or maybe, you know. You have to do a 26-month increments because that's Earth laps Mars every 26 months. That's when you can uh, make this voyage to or from Mars. Eventually, there's going to be a whole colonial fleets, not even colonial anymore, just massive transit, you know. 500,000 people going one way, 500,000 people going the other every 26 months will be this part of our culture. Um, so yeah, I'd like to go. I would like to go. Um, and I mean, early on, it's like being on the Mayflower a little bit, like you're in the shit, but kind of cool to be on the Mayflower or something near that. So i um, definitely going to go. I want to just be in microgravity in space. I want to see the earth from far away. I want to see Mars getting closer. I want to land on Mars. I want to walk around and one, no one talks about one third the gravity. How fun is that? You can. So I think it just works linearly. We're like, if right now I could jump, if I lived on a 
on the on a six story ledge, uh, sorry, a six foot ledge, uh, two meters for the non-Americans, I could just jump off of it, no problem, and head to my car. You know, just say my car is in that lot and I just want to like, there's a six foot ledge, I just jump off of it. You know, and I do a nice landing and I, and I get up and go. In Mars, I can do that on an 18 foot ledge, right? I think I can. And so if I can do that, imagine just, I just walk out of my, you know, third story, my, the, the third story uh, uh, apartment and I just walk off the balcony, jump down to the sidewalk. So I really want to do that badly. Um, and then, yeah, there's the biggest mountain in the whole solar system there, Olympus Mons, which is makes Everest look like a twig. And then there's the biggest canyon that makes the Grand Canyon look like a paper cut. So the whole thing is awesome. I really want to go. Um, and it's good blogging material, by the way, for sure. So, yes, that's the answer to that. Um, and I, by the way, think I really think and this is no one's talking about it, which is crazy. I mean, probably some of you were talking about it, but like um, it is. uh Definitely, like, there's going to, the Neil Armstrong of Mars is touching down in the mid-2020s. Um, that's insane. Like, that, no, why, like, this is the biggest deal ever. We have a new 1960s space decade coming up, but it's much cooler. People talk about, you know, um, great, uh, a great leap for mankind, right? It's not a great leap for mankind. It's not a great leap for mankind to touch the moon and give it a high five and come back and never go back again, and that's it. That's the end of it. It's a great achievement for mankind. If the first fish, so we all agree that going from ocean creatures only to now we have land life, that's a great leap for life, right? What if the first fish just kind of got up there, you know, slapped his fin down on the, uh, the shore, put a little flag and goes back in to the water uh, and that's it. No more. That's it. No, no, the land is barren from then on. Is that a great leap for life? No, it's a great achievement for that fish. That fish should be praised. I think there should be a little fish statue of that fish for sure. All of that. And it's nothing against Neil Armstrong, but let's not go a little over the top here with a great leap for life because it's not. The Mars thing is because there's going to be a colony there. And then eventually you're going to hit a million people. Probably, you know what happens, but this seems, from everything I've researched, and I've researched this a lot, I think probably this is going to happen. There's going to be a million people on Mars by the end of the 21st century. That's a self-sustaining civilization, meaning if the ships from Earth stop coming, because for whatever reason, air, asteroid, world war or something, Mars won't die out. It can expand to a billion people um, on its own, like, like we did here. That's a great leap for all of life. This is happening in our lifetimes. We're witnessing one of the great five leaps for all of life. Beginning of life, simple cell to complex cell, complex cell, like single cell to multi-cell, that's a big one, ocean to land, one planet to two planets. That is, that literally is on that list. It fits on the hand, the one single hand for all 3.8 billion years of Earth life. We're witnessing this in our lifetimes. That's just something that's hard to absorb how cool it is. So we should be talking about that. And yeah, if if we don't all extinct ourselves, which is fairly possible in the next hundred years, and we do make it through this and the, you know, where there, there, there's human consciousness, you know, 10,000 years from now, it's going to be super cool to have gone to Mars in the first couple decades. I mean, it really is like, true, we have, it doesn't, it can't, it doesn't feel like it because it never feels like it at this time, but we have a chance to do true pioneer stuff. We, this is our version of like, we, we can like be the first to cross the ocean and stuff. So that's my long answer to that. Um, I, sh I, I was now instructed, by the way, by my fiance as she left today, don't let this go on for a long time. You know, do, do an hour, but then, you know, get to the writing because you'll be in a terrible mood tonight and hate yourself if you didn't get at least four really focused hours in. And I have some other stuff to do. And yet, and yet, you know, I haven't even had some coffee yet, you know, so... I want to show you some stuff. You know, I bought a 60 sided dice the other day, um, which sounds cool, but it actually kind of just like, kind of like rolls around for eternity. Well, that was good, but like, you know, if you can't, you, it, 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 and if you do it too light or it's quick, it kind of feels like you're manipulating it. So, you know, there's some stuff. Um, let's just keep talking for a little bit. Uh, okay. So, um, 
someone said something I saw for a second. Oh, do you watch Westworld? Okay, let's talk about Westworld. Actually, but I'm not going to read your comments on it because I'm not caught up. I'm two episodes into season four, season two. And here's what I want to say. Obviously, season one. Awesome. Now, here's the thing. Season two started, and I, I heard from a friend that episode four, you know, get things get crazy. So I'm excited for that. But I don't know. I'm not sure I know what the fuck is going on. Maybe that's okay. Maybe that'll all later when I do get it, it all makes sense. I'm starting to be like, do the writers know? What's, are the writers kind of just like being like, you know, Dolores would be like, because that's the real thing. That's the, you know, that's the truth. And I'm like, the fuck is she talking about? And you know, you know that cow, you know, I don't, again, I don't know what's happening later, but you know that like handsome cowboy friend of hers? I'm him. He's, he's right now being like, the hell is wrong with this girl? Like, and that's how I feel. I'm like, what, what is going on with any of this? Season one did start to make sense toward the end, but now the problem is the beginning of season two has tainted season one for me a little where I'm looking back, I'm like, did all of that make perfect sense? Or were the writers kind of just throwing some shit in and being like, they won't know. So I'm a little jury's out. That said, overall, I would not, I would recommend anyone who hasn't watched it to watch it. It's, 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 it's good enough to get that recommendation because it's, I think part of the thing they have working in their favor is no one's quite done a show as awesome as Westworld in that way. That's really captured this idea yet. So it's also, it has the benefit of being kind of the first with a new idea, um, which is again, why I think maybe I'm taking a step back being like, if you, if you get beyond the awesome concept of this like park and these super life like robots and does this make sense? This whole gaining consciousness, like, and I was like, oh, well then she saw herself. Duh. And I'm like, I must be an idiot. And I'm sure everyone totally gets why that means she's conscious now. And I just, you know, I'm, and I'm kind of like, okay, I guess that's an artistic way to show consciousness. I don't know. This is, I have some thoughts on it, but um, also just a little random fact. Apparently the actress Dolores got criticized on Twitter for being a bad actress and she had a fit, which I thought was kind of funny and not a good move by her. Okay. Um, is Wait But High coming back? Good question. Yes. I don't know when. It's not a small thing. Uh, and it's honestly right now, it's a limit of Alicia's time. Alicia is... She does about 2x the productivity that I think a human would normally do. She's like truly like one thing I should write a post on is hiring. Um, I'm very proud of myself with hiring. Andrew and I together have kind of like, so Andrew's just for people, Andrew and I founded a couple companies before Wait But Why and we co-founded Wait But Why together. And now I focus on this and Andrew focuses mostly on our um, other company, Arbor Bridge which someone else asked, you know, why we don't promote Arbor Bridge on the site more. And the answer is that I'm terrified to promote anything on the site because I just don't want the site to be annoying. Um, it's like, I don't want to, I just feel like if I'm promoing something, if I, if I when we had ads on the site at the very beginning, it just felt like, I was like, hey, people who like this kind of stuff, come hang out. I have some stuff to show you. And then I'm like, hey, you, give me some money. Or no, I said, here, you could come in here and like basically pickpocket these people and then like give me a cut on the way out. Like, what? No, get out of here. Like, you know, and uh, obviously not, not, you know, I have the luxury of that because there's, there's systems like Patreon today. And because, um, you know, you just don't, don't have to rely on banner ads, but like, I, I like, it. so advertising our own thing is obviously better because I wouldn't, um, we wouldn't have built something if we weren't proud of it. We didn't think it was a really high quality thing. And I think Arbor Bridge is like the way, but why of test prep companies? I think it's a really, really, um, excellent, excellent test prep company. Our senior staff are like the smartest, best, you know, people ever and it's just a great company but it's just not something that um it just feels like a little bit of abuse of the kind of trust it's so hard it's so much competing for people's attention these days it's so hard to gain trust in people when they have all these options and and i feel like when, once you gain that it's like i'm just very stressed about abusing it so that's kind of the reason we don't advertise it but anyway back to this other question is that um we've gotten really good at hiring um, and I really want to write a post on it because it's a really important thing to get right. And the answer, the short answer is that hiring takes a ton of time to do well. You really have to go through a bunch of rounds. You have to give people all, you have to get to know their personality. You have to get to know, um, their philosophy on work. You have to get to know all this stuff. Then you have to, um, uh, spend some actual like real time with them, actually basically feel what it feels like to work with them. Um, you have to feel out their cook and chef situation. Are they going to repeat back kind of the ideas that they know you already think when they when you ask for their ideas? Are they do they have this original I, set of original ideas in their head? That, or they have the capability to think originally? A lot of people don't. You really want the people who do. They add a whole new brain to the mix. Otherwise, you're not actually adding a new brain. You're just adding a yes man or a woman. 
Um, and finally, you have to you give them real work to do, like actual work to do, um, and see what kind of problem solvers they are. Some people are just really good problem solvers. So anyway, we've made some very good hires in the last few years after early on in their career, like not knowing how to do it very well. And so Alicia is our most, you know, one of our most recent hires, and she's awesome because we know how to hire. So she's really productive, but she's really busy. Um, she's doing a ton of stuff. She's basically, and you know, the whole podcast is being built by Alicia and she has just always a million things to do on the site and a million emails coming in and scheduling and all of that. Wait, but high is big, 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 big project to do it well. And so we have ideas. We talked about a similar kind of wait, wait, but high. We talked about honing in on, you know, one or two of the things that happened at wait, but high and just scaling that we've talked about something that has to do with kind of discourse um, and talking about hard issues and trying to like arrange that somehow. So there's a lot of ideas. We're really excited about another one, but we just need to make sure that it makes sense with the time. Um, and yes, we could and should hire someone else at some point. And we probably can because of Patreon, which is another question, by the way, I just got asked is like, you know, about Patreon and like the lack of posts. And it's, it's not great. I feel very bad about people who are um, supporting the site and they're not getting much. The one thing is that when the post comes out, then, you know, if it's a, if it's a book and it was a free book because of Patreon, you know, what that means is that that's going to reach about 10 X the people, a, a blog post on wait, but why I think will reach about 10 X the people that of any book I ever do will. So patrons are actually funding 10 X impact, um, which is pretty cool. So I, um, that's kind of how I view that. And, uh, and I still feel terrible about it. And I wish, and I can't wait till the podcast is out and I'm doing shorter posts just because it's something still feels very guilty about having being supported and not having regular stuff coming out. So working on that, but patrons are very patient and very compassionate to my, the psychopath in my head, the perfectionist psychopath. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Um, are you a programmer? No, no, probably should be. It's funny. I went to college 2004. I graduated turned out to be like the time to be starting to be building stuff with programming. And um, I did not, I majored in government for no reason and learned about a bunch of things that I didn't actually really want to learn about at the time because government is not interesting. Once you're getting into like the weeds with it, you're like studying different, I don't know, it wasn't interesting and at least not to someone who was an asshole not doing his reading. Um, so no, I don't code. Um, although I do feel like that might be one of those things where like, this is actually an Andrew theory that I was about to steal. So I'll give him credit. Um, he, he always talks about how like, you know, a lot of people in our parents' generation are like, you got to get a grad degree, you know? And it's like, do you, do you have to get a grad degree? Like you could for some people, for some things, but like, and I think that you know, he think he's saying that he says that like the people, our generation will look at our kids and be like, you got to learn how to code. And they'll be like, no, I don't like, it's not, it's just not like something that you need to do anymore because it's just easy to build stuff without knowing how to code. So, um, there's a bunch of those things, by the way, while we're on this topic. I'm I, One of the things I love thinking about is how I'm going to be an old man. So one of them is for sure going to be, you know, because I'm like, oh, I'm, be, I'm just going to stay with whatever the new technology is. I'm good at, you know, VR already and I'm 36. And I'm, yeah, that's not what, it, that's not how it works. Um, how it works is something that is truly a different paradigm than you grew up with. So there's going to be brain machine interfaces, right? And people are going to be thinking with each other. And my grandkid is going to come over and start thinking to me. I'm going to be like, I can't, uh, can you just talk like a normal person? I'm going to be all angry and grumpy. And he's going to be like, grandpa, it's like, he's not, he just, just, just like try it. And I'll be like, I don't know how to do that. It's like, you're talking, thinking too fast. And that's not how I communicate. So that will be bad at that kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, there's a lot of these like things that are, uh, no, one of the, oh, here's another one. We're definitely going to be like, take off the headset and get outside. Like it was a sunny day. And the kid's going to be like, idiot. I am, I have a breeze machine and the UV machine. So I'm getting sun and I'm getting breeze. My whole world is right now, like on the top of Everest with like 17 of my friends I've met all around the world that share my interests. We're having an unbelievable discussion in the gorgeous sun on top of Everest. Um, while I'm like on my treadmill, getting my exercise, like whatever it is, they're going to really figure it out. And it's, and, I, and it's going to be this unbelievably healthy and beautiful outdoorsy thing. And they're going to be connecting and they're going to, and they're going to just see me like telling them to get outside onto like some boring suburban street by themselves, like kicking rocks. It's going to be a huge downgrade. So that'll be another old man thing of mine and other people's 
Although not mine, because I'm like, I hate those people who say get outside, so I won't ever do that. Um, um, what's your opinion on Pravda? That is Elon's new site to rate journalists. I am yet to see what it is when it comes out, but I like the concept. Okay, so we have, I can maybe spoil one thing from the post here. Um, well, I'll just talk about it, I won't show it. So picture like a two by two matrix. I think you have to put media not on a single scale rating. Media meaning a brand or a single journalist. There's a Y X axis. So there's a picture of square and you can plot people or brands anywhere in the square. The X axis, sorry, the Y axis is accuracy. Okay, so this is someone who's the top, they are very concerned with getting their facts right. Or they say, I don't know if this is right when they're not right. So they're trustworthy. They don't speak with conviction about stuff they don't actually know. And as you get to the bottom, you start to see more and more kind of bending of that rule. And at the very bottom, you have full full on lies, full on fake news intentionally. Um, or not intentionally, or they just copy something, some other fake news, and they don't care to look into it. And they trust that. That's just as bad, right? So accuracy, very important. But then there's objectivity. So just say in the middle so of the, on the horizontal axis, the middle is perfectly objective. Just really trying to look at the facts, with no spin, no bias. And then as you move right and left, you're going to get right and left bias more and more until by the end, you're just in insane land. But there's a big difference between the bottom left, right corners and the top left, right corners. The top and left, right corners, um, they're, they're like good attorneys, okay? They're very biased. They're telling one side of the story. They're trying to tell the... They're trying to cherry pick the true facts that will make their side look good. And they're maybe omitting some of the stuff that makes their side look bad. They're very much on a side, right? And, uh, and at the bottom, they'll ju they're just going to lie. They're going to take quotes out of context. They're going to maybe cherry pick so badly that it just tells a completely false story. And they're actively going to deceive in order to manipulate the reader or to get clicks or whatever it is. So obviously the best is the top middle. We all would love if everything was the top middle. Inevitably, you're gonna have bias. If they're fairly open about their bias, first of all, you know, like the Daily Show, the John Stewart Daily Show, like I have, I have my own criticisms of it, you know, looking back, especially given today's climate, I can see where it fit into that in a way that I don't think I appreciated at the time, but they were very open and honest about being objectively Left. They, they, John Stewart joked about being biased all the time and taking Fox News out of context. That made it so okay to me because I was taking it with the proper grain of salt. I was listening to an attorney and he was admitting that he's an attorney, not pretending to be a, a, set, a set of true statistics. So if you can, as a, as a reader, okay, you, if you, you're not going to necessarily be able to find the top middle. And if you want accuracy, you're probably going to end up with biased sources. That's fine. Just make sure you take some from both. You want both attorneys in the courtroom. That's why courtrooms work. You have both attorneys there. So I think that if, I hope Pravda thinks about this kind of thing and talks about both uh, when we're trying to rate both again, journalists and news sources, which does, does two things. It helps the reader see what they're reading and take the proper grains of salt or avoid, you know, things that are, oh, wow, wow this has a reputation for being inaccurate. Avoid it. Or this has a reputation for being accurate, but bias to the right. Okay, read it and take that with a grain of salt and make sure to read something that's biased to the left to fit to complete the sandwich of actual the actual story. Um, and so I hope it does something like that, which, which both helps the reader. And, and the other thing it does is it will create, right now there's not much incentive for media to be accurate or objective because there's not easy to measure that. So people want that. But it's not easy to measure that. You know, it is easy to measure. How much does this confirm my tribal bias, which is another metric that people also care about. So right now it's crushing on that. And that's where it's being rewarded. The more media is confirming the bias of its target tribe, the more it is succeeding um, financially. And they're for profit business. So they're going to optimize there. Uh, in the old days, if CBS in the 60s was known as inact less accurate, they would be hugely penalized for that. So they did. They actually tried to be accurate about incentives that's where things will optimize like evolution like anything else you know to market and so i think the answer isn't to yell at the journalists or the media they are doing frankly they're in a, they're in a for-profit business and you can't really expect as a whole certain ones will have a lot of integrity but, you know that supersedes the um or that you know that eclipses their commitment to 
you know, for-profit business, but you can't expect that when that's not the telos of a for-profit business, which is to make money. So you need to instead change the system somehow, rate it so people can see what's happening. Then a lot of things will, a lot of news organizations will get there together. They don't appear that. They're going to start saying, we need to research. They're going to start being very stressed out about getting put onto the bottom of that. And suddenly you're going to see a lot more accuracy and fake news is going to be penalized. And a quote taken out of context is going to be like a credit rating or credit score penalty. No one wants that. So suddenly you're going to have to, and they're going to be really big on admitting their bias because that's going to be part of what gets them up. If you admit your bias, you can be up. If you're pretending to be accurate, but you're being biased, sorry, if you're pretending to be objective, but you're being biased, even if you're being accurate with your facts, that's going to lower your accuracy because you're, um, you're, you're, you're making something seem like the whole story that's not, which is not accurate. So a lot more to say about that. And I will in this post. Um, that's one tiny little piece of this post. And that's like, this, that can be a post on its own, right? And there's 40 of those in this post. It's a lot. So, um, all right, let's do a few more. I can't, I do need to do something or I'll hate myself too much. Um, let me, uh, I just saw, oh, I didn't want to leave the site. I almost just did that. Um, let's just go down to the bottom here and see what's been said recently. Um, what are you, uh, what's your opinion of standardized tests? LOL. Um, I, I think that standardized tests are necessary right now because the alternative is what? The alternative in, in this current moment is just grades looking at when you're trying to assess, you know, students for admission. Um, and grades is totally not an objective measure. Different teachers have different systems, different schools, different competition. You need something to compare. Of course, it's not perfect. Um, it's first of all, favors certain kinds of intelligence over others. You know, some people are smart in one way or another and certain types are going to benefit. It's very like, it's not, you know, comprehensively, capturing a full person's brain's ability at all. Secondly, um, obviously it's a practice thing and some people have access um, and you know to tutors and to or schools who have a program for this or an uh, older sibling that is really great at helping and other ones don't. So it's a little like, you know, it's not quite like everyone's showing up to play basketball and some people have had a coach for a year and some people are picking up a basketball for the first time. That's a little extreme because obviously that would be tremendously unfair, but it's like somewhere between that and an objective measure. So I don't think it's great. Um, I think I'd love the, there to be something better. I also just think in general, big picture, like we need to assess a lot of things about education and college and other stuff in general. But um, I think right now I, it's hard to think of a mass scale scalable, you know, better solution in 2018, 2019. Maybe we can come up with something better. And, uh, you know, I would, I would like to hear about it. Someone has ideas, but. Um, okay. Um, all right. Uh, do you have any open positions? I don't know what that means. I think that's an icky financial question, but it could be an opinion question. If it's an opinion question, um, then yes, I'm like 90% of my positions are open. I would say yeah, 80, um, thoughts on meditation. Um, I downloaded headspace. I did the 10 things. I love that dude. I love his little videos a ton. And then I started doing, I bought it. I started doing the one for productivity. And every single time I do it, I finish and I'm so happy I did it. 15 minutes, 10 minutes, so happy I did it. Um, that's fact one. Fact two is that I don't normally do it. I then go weeks and weeks without doing it, which is not logical, not a rational agent. Fact three is that I don't know yet. I don't, I would say my own jury is still out on the long-term effects. Some people say, it literally will change your whole life. Um, and I'm fully open to that. I think that's very possible, but I'm just repeating what someone else said about it. I said, I don't have the experience myself. I've never done a big long retreat. I've never done this consistently. 
So I don't know if it's like a really important thing to do or just a really nice way to start your day and a nice way to kind of get your mind in a good zone because that it definitely is. So those are my three thoughts on meditation. Um, let's do two more. Um, there's a bunch of questions about careers that I've saw I've seen, but the thing is, I, um, I, I, I like really feel like I got out everything I currently had to say about it in that long post. And I feel like anything I say now is just going to be like a less accurate, less descriptive version of what I said there. So I think that like everything I would have to say to a young person about careers right now, or most of it is somewhere in that post. Um, but um, yeah, someone asked me another question in the Twitter list was, you know, if you could go back to your... 20 year old self or something, what would you tell him? Um, assuming I can't like tell him to like buy Bitcoin in 2013. Um, I would, um, one of the things I would just give like is personal like mentorship advice. And I would give this to a 22 year old now is like probably all or really to it, any age old right now, probably all your focus or most of it is really on ex defeating the external world, the battle, you against the world, right? Is it, you know, is it the battle to find a good relationship? Is it the battle to find a good job? Is it the battle to rise up in your job? Is it the battle to create the best startup, right? It's, you know, whatever it is. Um, to get famous, whatever it is. These are all you against the external world. And I really, really firmly believe, just looking at my own experience, that um, the, the internal battle going on, the internal shortcomings, the internal psychopaths and and children and animals that are in your head all stemming back. So there's a few different kinds of things in your head. There's just your tribal primal animal side that is very, very, very present. And it's like, that's not really you because you have this wisdom that you, when you're thinking, your left brain is kind of thinking that is this kind of point of higher wisdom usually, but it is like embedded in this animal and the animal's fears you feel, the animal's desires you feel. And when the animal's really, really active and you don't have control, like it is this fog and suddenly that inner, you really can't, you just kind of are the animal for a while and then you wake up out of it, right? This is a really big deal. This is not a small thing to get a hold of, okay? And then there's also just a bunch of previous you, previous versions of you. It's almost like rings of a tree. This is also in the post, by the way. Um, so it's like rings of a tree, you grow outwards just say, but so that means right under the surface is like you last year and you're the year before, right? So that, you know, the, the, the judgments of the world that 20 year old you had, they're in there somewhere. And when you have evolved out of that, that 20 year old is judging you and thinks you're lame. That voice is in there. Sometimes the 20 year old is right. And you've actually lost some integrity, you know, and the 20 year old is mad at you for a good reason. Sometimes the 20 year old wasn't very wise and was overly ambitious to say, or wasn't, you know, wasn't that empathetic or whatever it is. And um, wasn't that balanced? Wasn't that into balance? Didn't understand why that mattered. Wasn't, you know, cared about a lot of things over relationships and older you realizes that's wrong. So there's wisdom that older you has, the younger you didn't have. So sometimes you have to look at the 20 year old and say, no, you're wrong. I promise you you're wrong. And then stop listening. And other times you have to say, you know, you might be right. I think I've forgotten something that was important back then. So what you've got in your head is a bunch of animal past that is kind of this like thing that you're living inside of that is, that it's like you're seeing through its eyes. It's this creepy situation. And you have a bunch of other yous in there that all have their voices. And if you haven't processed, if, if, if 13-year-old you didn't process the middle school trauma of being outgrouped, you might find yourself hyper-political right now, super excited to be on the in-group. And it's killing your ability to think because that 13 year old is running your intellectual life when it comes to you know, political issues. So I would say to that 22 year old of mine, I would say, do not take your internal battles lightly. They are unbelievably difficult, but mindfulness about them and continuing to be aware of them and working and continuing to try to, I am working to try to defeat this instant gratification monkey every day and I'm trying different things and I'm getting better. I really am slowly but surely getting better because it's just a problem you still can solve, but it takes a lot of inner work and psycho inner psychology and brainstorming and trying things and trial and error and 
figuring out w- when you fail, you know, against that animal, why, what, what happened in that moment that you failed, whatever it is. So I would basically say, you know, three quarters of your effort and your thinking should be at least early on really about the internal situation. Then I really believe this is not just like a cheesy thing to say. I really believe that if the internal thing is in, in control, if you get good at that, the external world is easy. The external world is a run by people who have figured out the internal situation, I think. I think that those people then very quickly make progress. They understand human nature very well. They understand the game that they're playing. They understand that they have a good work ethic about it. They get the, they just, they, when you're acting like an adult across the board, like I think the world's pretty easy for you because it's kind of like playing basketball on a court of 11 year olds when you're suddenly 20. Like it's not hard to win that game. So I would, but, but so that when I think I was a 22 year old, I was another 11 year old in that court trying to play the game and, uh, you know, trying to beat the other 11 year olds. And I was like, wait a second, the game has become 20. Now the game, now the game, external game is easy. So that's what I would say to my 20, my young 20s self. And let's do one last question here. Um, uh, Explain to us your interest in life longevity and the science behind lengthening it. Okay. I am very interested in this. I think there's two things. Okay. This is going to be, I've written about this a little, but I have a lot more to write about. I want to write about Cryonics part two. Like I said, I want to write about um, life extension. And I think there's two games going on. There's, we did that through but the lowest hanging fruit, sanitation, antibiotics, things like that. Um, uh, uh, and you know, now infectious diseases. Um, so we're, we're doing this, and I think there's another big chunk to go with higher hanging fruit, but not that high. I think in the long run, given all the challenges we face, you know, the human body, I think we can eventually figure it out. So what what kills people now? What's the new, you know, sanitation and um, uh, you know, infectious disease and antibiotics? I think it's you know, heart disease and stroke and Alzheimer's, cancer. And um, I, I've i talked to enough people who seem pretty hopeful that these things are gonna be going way, 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 way down as killers. Um, and I think that as they do, a few things happen. I think that, you know, this is a two part thing where, you know, the, the people live a lot longer, but I think that 90 also becomes the new 60. And people at 90 are hiking and, you know, living good lives and people at 120, you know, or maybe, you know, not hobbled a little bit, but they're still thinking clearly like, so higher quality, obviously, you don't want to just have a bunch of vegetables that now can live to 180 uh, for the last 80 years. No one wants that. So I think it has to go along with quality, but I think that is happening. I think, and they go together. You know, if you cure the things that kill people, you're also going to cure a lot of the things that hobble people and that diminish people. So that's what, that's the small game because there's actually a limit on uh, these, these guys I was talking to yesterday from Nectome. You know, he talked about how the, it's, he compared the human memory, the human brain to like a field. And you can imagine digging a hole in, in the field is a memory. And that hole is going to expand outward like this over time as you, you know, more stuff, whatever, but eventually, and then all these different holes, eventually the holes start to overlap. There's just not enough kind of like space. I don't know. This is not me having research. This is me repeating what he said. So take that with a grain of salt, but I've also, also just heard other things where it's like without a dramatic change, even if we fix a lot of the things that kill us, like the human brain can't really manage for that much longer. So that's why this is the little game. This is a game to increase quality of life and, 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 and decades in our life, which is a huge, obviously a huge deal. It's as big a deal as going from when we all died at 40 to dying at 80. That's, you know, what could be a bigger deal than that? Um, the second game is the big game, which is, this is something I need to write about and I need to research a lot more before I really get into it. But I think there's going to be a real time when we have learned to upload ourselves. Um, I've talked to now that this is from early conversations, So I could change my mind on this, but I've had some conversations with some very smart people in different fields, people in biology, um, I think have been less, um, less into these ideas, but I think that maybe, um, this is something that is, uh, is actually different than biology and it's the concept of, um, you know, can we preserve brains, A, and then B, can we extract that data and upload it? 
uh, it's not just kooks talking about this. There's some very smart people and I think it's going to become a bigger and bigger topic. Um, and, um, to me, if we can pull that off, if we can pull that off and now we don't have to rely on this physical animal, we don't all, we're, we're, it's like a hack. If we can pull it off, it's going to look like it'll be the, oh, so there was the animal era. And then there was the human consciousness era, you know, where human consciousness lived separate from biology and separate from mortality. Um, and this is going to be the hack era where like the consciousness is in there, but it's stuck in an animal. Basically evolution's like, I'm going to stick you in an animal for now until we, you know, until you guys figure out how to get yourselves out. That's kind of what the deal is now. So if we can get ourselves out, um, and there's a lot of people that are, you know, have a lot of counter arguments and I need to dig into those before I can write about this with conviction. But if we can do this and it's something we actually learn how to do, and even the, the technology that matters for people alive today is the preservation. If we can just learn to preserve for now, then we can learn to extract and upload later. And that's fine. The person's brain is intact for whenever that happens. This is getting to the, you know, the cryonics kind of concept. Um, so if we can do that, I really think that's the, that's like the real AD, BC borderline. We look at like, you know, BC and AD. What is that? It was some religion's state. I mean, it's not a real thing. Um, this is the real thing. This is the end. This is the old era and the new era. And there's really only two eras. I mean, as far as I can imagine, if that, if that really happens. And people in that era are going to look back to this as BC. We live in BC. It's shitty. You know, because you always live in someone's well, someone else's BC. And, you know, and so we're in BC, I think unfortunately, but the coolest thing ever is things are moving so quickly that we really might, we might cross over. We might be here at the borderline. How cool, how cool to be there for everyone else who comes later. It's like, yeah, I was there. I, I experienced BC. That's going to be really cool. So I think we should enjoy that and hope that it happens soon because the most annoying shit I can possibly imagine is the last generation to, to involuntarily die. So annoying. It's like getting to the front of this like line and it's moving in, you know, the Disney World thing and then they cut it off and you have to wait 40 minutes to the next show right before you. It's like the worst version of that. So let's not do that. So I want to write a lot about that. And I hope that smart people are going into brain preservation. Um, not just the cryonics way. There's lots of different kinds of technologies that are trying to do this. Um, I hope people are going to brain preservation. I hope people are going into AI safety. Um, and, uh, and because we're basically playing this super high stakes game right now. That no one is, we woke up in the middle of a thriller movie, a choose your own adventure thriller movie that either has an extremely happy or extremely sad ending. And like, we, you know, we should be trying to nudge that if we can. So I'll finish there and let me know if you, if, if this was uh, a really long time. So I'm going to finish there. Thanks for coming.